Let's begin together. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is just doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console. To be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you, everyone. You can have your seat. Ka Andres Bonifacio, aling pag-ibig pa ang hihigit kaya? Gaya ng pag-ibig natin sa tinubuang lupa. Tayong lahat ay magkabuklod-buklod ngayong gabi. Dahil sa pagmamahal natin sa ating bayan, malayo man tayo sa ating lupang sinilangan, tayo ay narito upang bigyang pugay ang lahat na nagsakripisyo o nagbuwis ng buhay, upang ating makantan ang demokrasya at ang kasarinlan at ang pagtamasa ng ating mga karapatan bilang tao, bilang pamayanan. On behalf of the Filipino Human Rights Advocates in Chicago, here in Illinois, I welcome all of you who are here tonight and all of those who are watching us from Philippines and all over the world through our Facebook live streaming to our vigil and community um, reflection. Not only to be in solidarity with the celebration of the 153rd birth anniversary of our real hero, God Andres Bonifacio, but also to remember the many other real heroes who fought for our democracy and human rights during one of the darkest periods of the Philippine history, the martial law regime, led by no other than the dictator himself, Ferdinand Marcos, who never deserved a burial at the National Hero Cemetery in the Philippines. The Marcoses may have cheated us once more by allowing the clandestine hero's burial of the martial law dictator last November 18th. But they will never make us forget what they have done against us, against those who rose up against his tyranny, against those who were martyred for their cause, against those whose lives were taken away from this world. We will never abandon history. We will never allow the historical injustices to happen, to happen once more against the Bangsamoro, the Christians, and the indigenous peoples of our homeland. Today we are here to stand up for the rights of the victims of the martial law. Today we are here to speak up for the people whose voices are not heard. Today we are here to celebrate our martyrs and our real heroes. Kaya aling pag-ibig pa ang hihigit kaya, gaya ng pag-ibig natin para sa tinubuang lupa, wala na nga, wala. Welcome to everyone. Us, um, no, him personally. In the 70s, uh, he was a student activist in Yupi Diliman and later in medical school. He joined the Samahana Makabayang Scientifico and Liga ng Agham para sa Bayan and took part in the first quarter storm on the Diliman Commune. At the Yupi College of Medicine, he contributed articles to the newsletter Yupi Medics joined the Progressivo Filosang Medical, helped organize the Medical Student Society, and volunteered in the college's outreach program called Clinica ng Bayan. He spent his required six-month rural medical work in Samar province, where he saw the dark reality into which Ferdinand Marcos Juan Manu had plunged the province. He saw besides extreme poverty, 
widespread maltreatment of these of citizens. It was a place where medical services were badly needed. After graduating from medical school, Bobby Villapaz together with his physician wife, Sylvia, turned his back on a potentially lucrative career in Manila and left for Samar to set up a community-based health program there for the poor. The national origin took note of the couple's activities and they were labeled as subversives. There he was assassinated by martial law forces. Then uh, he was assassinated by a single gunman on April 23, 82, while he was working in his clinic. For over seven hours at the Sama Provincial Hospital, doctors took turns operating on him to save his life, while his wife, Sylvia, facilitated blood donations from friends community health workers, and former patients, even from nearby islands. Outside the cordon of hospital, scores of people, rich and poor, held a vigil and prayed. Delavas happened just past midnight, and he was 29 years old. Say again his name. To remember, to remember his contribution to you. <clears throat> in fact, in the uh, paper, uh, let's say his name. Emmanuel Agapito Lacaba. Emmanuel Lacaba was an artist who had to choose which art is in his heart to follow. Art for art's sake, or art for people's sake. He was a poet and worker who searched for meaning and relevance. Edgar Edjok Mirisol Hobson. Edgar Hobson was the most well-known figure in the student movement, being president of the National Union of Students of the Philippines, which was the largest student formation with members coming from 69 schools before the martial law period. After graduation, Jobson turned away from job opportunities in the Philippines and abroad, choosing instead to work with the Philippine Association of Free Labor Unions. He took up law at the University of the Philippines, which he abandoned after a couple of years, convinced that the laws he was studying were for the rich. He remained with the labor movement, living among the workers and helping draft collective bargaining agreements. He was instrumental in organizing the landmark workers' strike at La Tondeña Distillery in 1974, the first significant open mass protest under martial law. By this, with the martial law regime, Closing off all avenues for peaceful change, Jobson had taken the radical path. He was soon a ranking leader of the anti-dictatorship revolutionary movement, tasked to head the preparatory commission for the National Democratic Front of the Philippines. In 1979, he was arrested in Metro Manila and tortured while under investigation, under interrogation. After 10 days, he escaped and Im immediately rejoined the underground. He made a written test testimony that detailed the physical and mental torture he underwent. <clears throat> His torturers' names, <coughs> rank, and personality profiles. In 1981, with a 180,000 pesos price on his head, making him then one of the most wanted persons in the country, Jobson simply went on with his work. He went to Mindanao, learning and writing, developing insights into the unique characteristics that shape the region's history and present situation. 
on September 20, 1982. He was captured during a military raid in Davao City, shot while trying to escape, he, taken alive, brought to the military camp, and interrogated. He refused to cooperate and was summarily executed the following day. He was 34 years old. Let us remember his name. In 1974, he decided to join the New People's Army in South Cotabato. He took the name Popoy Dakoy Koy, an allusion to a comic book character whose name he had once used for a character in an epic poem he had written in the 1960s. Lakaba had been with the NPA two years when in March 1976, an informer led a troop of soldiers to the peasant hut where he and his fellow guerrillas had spent the night. With no warning shots or calls for surrender, the soldiers opened fire. All the guerrillas were killed immediately except Lakaba and a pregnant teenager who were both wounded. They were being taken to Tagum, Davao del Norte, when the sergeant who headed the soldiers gave the instruction, quote, not to bring anyone back alive, unquote. The pregnant woman was first to be shot dead. Then Lakaba, who is said to have dared the informer Go ahead, finish me off. The informer had put a 45 caliber pistol into his mouth and fired. Makaba's mother claimed her son's body later. I just would like to say something about Emmanuel Lakaba because he is in the same town where I am. Uh, I used to live in the Philippines, which is in. Uh, Pasig City. He was also a, uh, a scholar and uh, he went to the uh, school that I went to, Pasig Catholic College. He was a uh, exchange student also uh, during that time. Uh, he went to the United States. You know, I don't know if you remember those exchange students between mm -hmm. the U.S. So he was one of them. Wow. Um, a very popular guy. He was about three years, maybe older than me, and uh, a valedictorian in that uh, high school. Um, so I, I have personal uh, kind of, in a way, relationship. I, I know I was with him in one of the strikes among the workers one time. He was with the uh, trade union uh, supporting. Lorena, Marie, and Barros. Uh, Maria Lorena Barros remains today one of the one, most well-known heroes of the anti-dictatorship struggle, a char charismatic leader, gifted writer, I icon of the modern Philippine feminism, the gentle warrior who defiantly confronted death at the hands of government soldiers deep in the forest of the Sierra Madre. Earning up honors from grade school through college, Barros graduated from the University of the Philippines in 1970 with a degree in anthropology. She started teaching after graduation while taking up master's courses at the UP. She was already making a name for herself as a writer, publishing poetry and essays in various publications, and eventually being elected president of the UP Writers Club. By the end of the 60s, Lori Barros was being drawn into political activism. She joined exposure trips to the rural areas and immersed herself in the emerging political literature. She organized the all-women Makibaka, um, Malayang Kilusan ng Bagong Kapapainan, and became its first chairperson. Um, Makibaka chapters quickly spread across the country, in factories, in villages, and even in exclusive girls' schools. When President Ferdinand Marcos suspended the writ of habeas corpus in 1971, Barros was one of the 63 student leaders charged with subversion. She went underground, got married, and had a son. 
all the while keeping up a stream of correspondence with family and friends. She was arrested in default in November. Kate Baroness was born in Washington, USA, of a large and poor family. His father was a Filipino migrant worker and his vocation mother, a waitress in a small farming town with considerable Filipino-American community. Jane, a hot newspaper in Seattle, where he documented how Filipino-Americans participated and even led in the union struggle in the U.S. from the turn of the century, 20th century, to the 1950s. Though his association with stu a various student group in Seattle, Jean became one of the first members of the Seattle-based movement against the martial law in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, he was also an active in the Alaska Scannery Workers Association International Longshoremen and Warehouse Men Union, ACWAILWU, and the Northwest Labor Employment Law Office, LELO. He and a fellow activist, Silmi Domingo, began to seek youth reform within ACWA ILDW Seattle chapter called Local 37. Inspired by stories told by older union members, the Manongs, to seek fair hiring and dispatching procedure, in 1981, Jean came to the Philippines for the first time, where he saw for himself grinding poverty unlike any he had seen before, but also the heroic struggle against such poverty as well as against the repressive policy of the Marcos regime. He met with many workers, activists, and even visited the guerrilla zone in the countryside. Later, with, he would recall telling a very young guerrilla fighter that like the latter was too young to understand the dynamics and the philosophy of the struggle against dictatorship and that he should go back to school, to which Jim got the following answer. How old does one have to be to understand right from wrong? Jim then traveled to Hawaii, where together with Silmi Domingo made a presentation at the International Convention of ILWIJ in Hawaii, providing documents that gave details of Marcos' repressive rule, including anti-labor decrees promulgated by the regime. With the support from the giant local 142 in Hawaii, incidentally heavily represented by migrant Ilocanos, and despite opposition from Marcos' ILWIJ members, Local 37 won over the entire convention into passing a resolution criticizing these repressive policies and authorizing a high-level ILWIJ team to travel into the Philippines to look into the human rights situation in the country, particularly involving Filipino workers. The ILWIJ Convention's critical position was potentially disastrous to the Marcos regime. Marcos was scheduled to the state visit in the U.S. the following year, 1982, where they expected to secure U.S. from his friends and supporter, Ronald Reagan. Making any political action against him in the U.S. a huge public relations disaster. Less than a month after their coup of sort in Hawaii, Sylvia and Jean was shot dead inside the local 37 office in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Two gunmen simply walked in and fired at the two. Jean died on the spot, but Sylvia managed to give the identities of the assailants before he died next day. Say that. Say the name. Yes.
Maclean Dulag was a respected elder of the Bukbut tribe in the tiny mountain village of Bugnay in the 1960s. He was a pangat, one of those listened to the community because of their wisdom and courage. He was also elected barrio captain of Bugnay, serving out three terms since 1966. In 1974, the regime tried to implement a 1,000 megawatt hydroelectric power project to be funded by the World Bank along the Chico River. The plan called for the construction of four dams that would have put many villages underwater, covering an area of around 1,400 square kilometers of rice terraces, payu, orchids, and graveyards. As many as 100,000 people living along the river, including McLean's Bugnai's village, would have lost their homes. To the Marcos dictatorship, the indigenous communities of the Cordillera mountain range in the north of Luzon could easily be dealt with as it proceeded with its plan to build a huge dam on the Chico River. But the Kalinga and Bundok people knew that the project would flood their rice fields and their homes, communal forests and sacred burial grounds. It would destroy their lives by changing their environment forever. McLean become or became a strong and articulate figure in this struggle, which pitted small, nearly powerless communities in the Calderias, Calderieras against the full powers of the martial law regime. Kalinga and Buntok Leaders were offered bribes, harassed by soldiers and government mercenaries, even in prison. But the anti dam leaders, including McLean Dulag, stayed firm in their appointment should not be achieved as such extreme sacrifice. They surrounded his house one night and sprayed it with bullets. His assassinations merely solidified opposition to the dam and wanted sympathizers from all over the country and even abroad. Even the World Bank, which would have funded the dam construction, withdrew from the project, finally forcing the martial law government to cancel its plans. Mabuhay ka, Maclean Dulag! Mabuhay, Maclean Dulag! Just... Many, different, um, many of his uh, colleagues' experiences in martial law. And, and so this is the epilogue um, of his book. Um, this is the story of my journey during the martial law years. Through the twists and turns of this terrifying journey, other people, brave men and women, also took this less traveled road to oppose the tyranny and rootlessness of the Marcos dictatorship. This is also the story of my friends and comrades with whom I have shared my life. There are times when we start to think about the future. Who among us will survive to tell our stories? This is also, um, yes, martial law is now over. The cruel tyrant had died, but there are other perpetrators during this gruesome era, and many of them are still around today. Now, they use their ill-gotten wealth to attempt to rewrite history and boldly proclaim to the present generation who were not even born during the dictatorship years that martial law was good for our country. This is the, quote, pseudo-documentary um, presently circulating on YouTube with the title Martial Law versus People Power, The Untold Story. It is a 20-minute presentation extolling the virtues and accomplishments of the conjugal dictators. It enumerated all those nice and expensive projects like the North Luzon Expressway, the Folk Arts Theater, the Philippine Heart Center, among others. It trumpeted that Marcos built more roads, bridges, and hospitals than all the previous presidents of the Philippines combined. But there was no mention whatsoever about the greedy cronies and members of the Marcos family who looted and plundered the economy through kickbacks and corruption. Who could forget about the iron nuclear plant and the Chico River dams whose loans financed by the World Bank were the sources of ill-gotten wealth through bribery, overpricing, and unpaid foreign loans. 
It was also very ironical that when Cardinal Sin rallied the people to go to EDSA to preserve democracy, the people behind this presentation dismissed this phenomenon as merely hot crowds. This is the way traditional politicians would entice the poor to join mass actions in exchange for a free meal and 100 pesos in cash. Communist-led groups, curious onlookers in the yellow armies of glory, had smeared at the 2 million people in Manila who answered the call of Cardinal Sin as merely 2% of the 55 million Filipinos at that time. Um, so my daughter, Mila, also posted on Facebook the following summary of the abuses of the Marcos dynasty during martial law. Um, this is what a tragic presidency looks like. Number one, he declared martial law and suspended freedom of expression to assume dictatorial powers. Number two, there was no press freedom as he closed all media outfits and let his cronies to control the press as his propaganda machine. Number three, he let he himself enacted and directly controlled the national budget through decrees after he abolished Congress. Number four, most of the major infrastructure projects were funded and initiated through international loans and war reparations, and not from the national budget. Number five, he let his cronies control the national economy that led to social inequality and abuse of worker rights. Number six, he made the military and constabulary forces as his personal death machine to silence all critics of his dictatorship. Number seven, the country experienced a debt crisis after he failed to pay foreign loans and obligations on time, leading to the de depreciation of the peso and mass migration of investors. Number eight, he let the armed forces carry out mass killings and torture to remove indigenous peoples from their ancestor lands. And number nine, the sugarcane and coconut farmers suffered from the, his unfair policies and programs. On October 20, 2015, Berlin Bongbong Marcos Jr. filed his, certifi his certificate of candidacy for vice president. Political analysts consider this as a trial balloon of the Marcos family to eventually recapture. We are tribeless and all tribes are ours. We are homeless, and all homes are ours. We are nameless, and all names are ours. To the fascists, we are the faceless enemy who come like thieves in the night, angels of death, the ever-moving, shining, secret eye of the storm. The road less traveled by were taken and that has made all the difference. The barefoot army of the wilderness. We all should be in time. Awakened, the masses are Messiah. We are among workers and peasants. Our last generation has found its true, its only home. on the fragrant earth and listen to the grasser whisper. I see a song and I dream. I dream that your eyes are shining while you smile, mine, mine alone. I dream that I am touching some happy thing you ha your hand has won. I dream Oh, I dream of things impossible, like a foolish spider speeding through silence, in but a moment swept away by cobalt winds of the illusion men. What does it matter? Why should I cease when all my life is in dreams?
Abra? Yeah, I'm going to say Abra. He'll yeah. probably correct me later. But, um, and that's how he got involved um, working with the farmers in the area, and he started to organize them. And he was labeled like, the subversive then, and that's how he was thrown into prison. Um, and while in prison, he also led a hunger strike um, mm. in the prison because, again, he saw how unjustly treated everybody was in prison. So he, him and another priest um, led a hunger strike. So this is in remembrance for my mom's first husband, my mother, um, Emilia Balano, and my father, Manuel Lajos. This is for them. The uh, other um, <coughs> people who departed that I personally had worked with and known Leanne Alejandro and um, the other nuns that I've worked with in the past. I don't, there's so many of them, priests that I've worked with during my work at community-based health programs. The nameless farmers who disappear while we're doing <coughs> community services and uh, the nameless women who supported their husband farmers disappearing and had left and was left 
with their children to support. I also want to honor even the ones who are still alive. One I personally know, and maybe you know, uh, Merla Baldonado, who was in prison for a while and never uh, wavered and still working back home <coughs> here. Father Dom Tison, who I know also was tortured when he was in prison, and others who I cannot name now, but so many people. Um, I'd like to honor my Tito. Um, I don't actually know his name because my family doesn't really talk about him, but. Um, he and his girlfriend were activists during the martial law era, and they were um, shot when they were riding a jeepney by unknown gunmen, but people knew that it was related to um, the activism that they did during that time. Um, in addition to that, I'd like to honor all the people who were silenced during the martial law era, and also people who are working towards a better Philippines and are being oppressed by um, modern forms <coughs> of dictatorship. My name is Pat Nabo. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to suggest that we take a deep breath to connect the common human value of life. And I thank you uh, all those who organized this event. I, I thank you uh, Afire for providing this space and I thank you all for coming and making sure that we don't forget our real heroes Bonifacio was an inspiration during the student movement and his story was seems to be just like a historical story, there's no connection, but we were still inspired. But right now we are living in memory, people that we've been, our friends, our brothers, our mothers, our sisters. I would like to honor again Nilyasa, Liliosa Hilao, the Arceo brothers, they were my juniors. During the student movement. But we were urban poor people. And those three decided to continue the fight. The Arceo brothers went to Mindanao and they are so skinny that we, we you can even imagine that they be able to fight. But they went. Liliosa Hilao, as mentioned, she cannot even maybe kill a mosquito. But the torture, she was the first victim of torture where the muriatic acid was poured in her property and the Internal organs were taken and put in a pail of muriatic acid. That's senseless. Very, very horrifying. That you cannot even think that you will be able to fight the dictatorship. Because the regime of fear is all over. You can hear it from your neighbors, from the, from the workplaces, from the school. And I'm crying 
because it looks like the current situation seems to be similar that people are scared to talk and I'd like to honor the courage of the youth same as during the student movement that they were able to crack the fear and now shout, shouting again to fight for a better society. Once again, a thank you for the community to come over here and we will have, and as they said right now, the message is to continue the fight mm -hmm. and we will not, and for me as a personal commitment because of those people that I knew who were killed, tortured, because of the belief that there's a better Philippines for all of us. I suggest again to take a deep breath to connect with all those heroes. Thank you. So I hope uh, what happened during martial law were freedom of expression and uh, the press were suppressed will not happen again. napaka-insenteng buka ng ating mga kasamahang nahimlay at natumba nung mga gading iyon ng panahon ng Rehemeng Marcos at ang kanyang mapangabuso Marcelo. Mga kapatid, mga kaibigan, ako po ay 7 years old pa lang noong 1971. Siguro grade 1 ako Ang naalala ko from grade 1 to grade 6, si Makoy ay bida. Pero, nung dumating po ako ng high school, napatay po si Ninoy Aquino. Alam niyo po, hindi natin may higitan ang hirap na nadanas ni Hilaw. Ayon sa pagnarit ng kanyang kaklase, yung matalik na si Paring Jerry. Ako po ay nalulungkot din dahil hindi man ako umabot ng edad ng kamulatan noong 1971, ang Panginoong Diyos ay tinadhana akong magising ang kabataan ng mamatay ang yumaong ninoy. Alam niyo po, Sa Pilipinas, umaaklas, nabubuhay sa, pag, sa, um, sa tulog ang ating mga kabataan at kababayan at nagigising lamang katulad ng pag-alala natin kay Dr. Jose Rizal, kay Andres Monifacio. Nagigising lang tayo pag may namamatay. Ako nagising nung namatay si Nino. Ngayon, nakal al alam po ninyo na ako makajos ako eh. Alos na patawad ko na mga Marcos eh. Dahil nakalimutan ko na eh sa tagal. Kaya lang, sabi mo nga sa mga kasama ko, parang itong may sari-sari store ako sa isang corner sa barangay. May umutang. Matagal lang hindi nagbabayad. Nakalimutan ng sari-sari store owner. Ngayon, Nakalimutan na nga, ibiglang ibinibida na naman ng, na nangutang sa sari-sari store ng kakaunti yung pera. Hanggang nalaman tuloy niya natin na hindi lang pala sa sari-sari store ang utang. May utang din sa PNB, sa Coco Bank, IMF, World Bank, ang mga ninakaw ni Marco. Lalo pang naungkat. Nakalim Halos nakalimutan na natin talaga eh. Ako'y nalulungkot ng si, si Bongbong ay muntik ng maging vice president. Pero nagkakamali sila, mga kapatid, mga kaibigan. Dahil sa binubuhay nila ang patay. Ang patay, binubuhay nila. Napakasakit. Napakasakit na si Marcos ay ililibing sa libingan ng mga bayani. Hindi man ako nakatikim ng muriatic acid, nakaamoy naman ako ng tirgas sa medyola nung nasasama sa ako. 
student leader po ako ng FAO. The last quarter storm. Nandun doon pa ako sa EDSA 1. At would you believe nandun din ako sa EDSA 2. Pagpabagsak eh, era. Ngayon, <laughs> sa January uuwi ako. Kaya sabi ng uncle ko, huwag ka na muna kumuwi. Huwag na uwi ka dito. Anyway, nakaka, nakakalungkot. Dinadaan na lang natin to sa counting niya. Uh, pero, ma, ma, masakit at hindi ma-describe what did Duterte did has ignited again the fury of the Filipino people. Kaya babalik ulit ako doon sa sari-sari store. Marcos singiling Duterte ating panagutin. Maraming salamat. Ako si Sally Richmond. Uh, nais kong bigyan ng honor ang uh, mga uh, mga taong simbahan sa Cavite. Uh, mga pare at madre na naging biktima ng Marciano. At sila ang nagbulat sa akin makita kung ano ang tunay na kalagayan during the Marcos region na kung saan natuto ako sa kanila na makiisa at uh, maging kabahagi ng mga pangyayari. Bago, bago ako na, nasama sa kanila, ako ay uh, isang ordinaryong uh, mamakayan na hindi naniniwala sa kung ano yung kanilang pinakikipaglaban, ang nakikita ko lang, bakit sila ay maingay, bakit sila ay magulo, bakit sila nang gugulo. At ang mga mati at pari, at uh, ang mga leaders, yung mga kasama namin sa samahan, sa Cavite sila ang nagmulat sa akin kung ano ang tunay at ano ang pakikibaka, ano ang kanilang ipinakikipaglaban. At ako ay nagpapasalamat at ako ay naging bahagi ng pagkikipaglaban at patuloy na pagkikipaglaban. Uh, hello. Uh, to si uh, Ed Tadara. Uh, I would like to pay, give tribute to those, to the, um, to my fellow student activists who offer their lives. And to those nameless peasants who offer their lives to for the cause against the Marcos dictatorship. In addition to Sally's uh, reflection, I would also like to dedicate this sacred remembering to our friends in Cavite who also fought, who really fought for true democracy, who are now, for the, who are now, who have now passed away. May their full soul, we pray for their full souls tonight. Father Joe Dizon, Father Nel Matanggihan, Father Cesar Reyes, Father Ignacio, and also Bishop Perez, who lead them, who lead us in organizing in Cavite and Southern Tagalog. Magandang gabi po. Uh, Pagunita kay Jimmy Malikden, isang leader mala malalita. Uh, nagsimula siyang loyalist sa katunayan yung anak niya ay pinangalan niya Ferdinand at Imelda. Masatirik yung bahay nila sa Tambakan, Paranaque. Tambakan kasi ito yung pagsaka ng lahat ng basurang nakukonekta sa metro. Ito lang sa may asina ng Paranaque. Hindi na nakita siya. At ayon sa mga kakilala at kaibigan na, na kadinig kung ano nangyari, uh, dinukot siya ng mga militar. Ang huling uh, nakita sa kanya yung bisikleta na ka, 
nakasandal sa ilalim ng tulay. Siya ay isa sa mga leader na nagsimulang loyalista na naging bahagi ng Kulusang sa marami ng Tagalunson. Magandang gabi po sa lahat. Ako po si Christine. Uh, bago po ako na nagawi dito sa Chicago, itong taon po ako nagtrabaho sa Mindanao. At uh, uh, personal ko po nakita yung mga uh, innocenting civilian na naapektuhan sa Kiara at sa Human Rights Violations doon. Kaya sila ang gusto kong alalahanin mo yung gabi na sinulat ang paunti. Um, today, I offer my thoughts and prayers as I remember the lives of women, men, and children who were mad mm -hmm. because of their beliefs. Tonight, I remember the almost 1,000 Taosuk women, men, and children who were killed during the first battle of Budaho as they were fighting to resist colonization. Tonight, I remember the mass murder of more than 70 Muslims in Manili, Kalmen, North Cotabato on June 19, 1971, while gathering in the mosque to participate in a supposed peace talks with the Christian groups. Tonight, I remember the more than hundreds of indigenous peoples in Mindanao who were summarily, summarily executed as they were defending their homelands and their cultural territories from the exploitation and abuses of extractive companies and groups with selfish vested interests. Tonight, I remember the 58 victims of Maguindanao massacre, including women, journalists, lawyers, and innocent civilians, just because there are those political leaders who would be willing to kill people for the greed of power. Tonight, I remember the community leaders I have met in Mindanao, where I am from, who continue to fight for the rights of the civilians, displaced and affected by the armed conflict, and who continue to work spiritual energy to still go on because we are actually the instrument and the continuation of what they have fought for. Mahalaga sigurong magkaisa ang lahat ng mga grupo para sa kalayaan at demokrasya. Ang susi sa ating pagkakaisa ang uh, mag-aanak mag ng ating minimiki ng more than 400 years. So, yun lang ang masasabi ang uh, Sana ay magkaroon more tayo ng mga pag-uusap na ganito, uh, mga activities at uh, lalo pang lumaki ang ating mga grupo at mga pinanindigang mga mithiin para sa ating komunidad dito at sa para, para sa ating bayan. Ako ay siya Pastor Gert Villaluz. Um, Wala po akong personal na uh, eksperyensya na nakadanas o naka-witness uh, uh, ng talagang karahasan. Pero may mga kapamilya po ako naging biktima on both sides of the conflict during martial law. So masasabi ko lang po ay... Uh, May patuloy ang paggunitan nito ay mahalaga na nakikilala natin, na admit natin na ang buhay ng tao ay mahalaga pagkat ito ay uh, it is uh, uh, with dignity na nilalang ng Diyos ang tao. Lahat ng buhay. Kaya may human rights na tinatawag tayo dahil ito ay para sa lahat ng katauhan. Kung merong mga mga Nagbabiolate nito ay tama lamang na tayo ay uh, tumayo at uh, igalang ito at paglaban. At ang masasabi ko lang po ay yung tunay na kalayaan na makakamit natin ay mga galing sa puso natin mm -hmm. na 
mapalaya tayo bawat isa sa anumang pagkaka uh, gapos sa atin sa ating sariling buhay upang tayo maging pagpapala sa lahat ng sangkatawan. Maraming pong salamat. na yung masa ang kwentong may, may, may isi-share ko kung wala ang masa hindi nagpapatuloy ang kilusan dahil silang nagbibigay ng mga bahay na taguan, bahay ng mitingan silang nagbibigay ng mga pagkain kahit wala silang pagkain silang nagbibigay ng tulugan silang nagbibigay ng mga uh, informasyon kaya ang sabi nga ang tunay na bayani ay ang masa lamang sana pwede natin kantahin yung ang masa ang masa lamang pwede uh, ang masa lamang 